The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good day. It's uh, 12 o'clock sharp. I suggest to wait one or two more minutes. Um, we already have 36 people attending, but I think we're expecting uh, a couple more. I suggest we start. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to our second BSC lunch session. It's almost one year ago, October the 7th to be precise, we organized our first lunch session and it was on AI. Today we organize a session on, on OpenFOAM. OpenFOAM is a very popular open source package in the field of fluid dynamics. And it's a topic that's a typical example where HPC infrastructure is being used. Actually, it's not the first time that Open Foam is covered by the BSC. Some of you maybe attended the Play Seasonal School in April this year. It was called an introduction to Open Foam and organized together by Play's Universities of uh, Leuven and Ghent. And we're actually very happy to have people today present here presenting from three different organizations. On the one hand, we have the von Kerman Institute for Fluid Dynamics. They simply have fluid dynamics in their name. Uh, we have the University of Ghent, and then we have a, a company which is also already a long-time user of the, of the VSC infrastructure. As you may notice, this session is uh, being recorded. The handouts of the slides will be made available. If during the session you would have any questions, don't hesitate to put it in, in the chat and either at the end of the presentation or at the end of the session, we'll try to cover uh, all or let's say most of your questions. Well, our first case, may, maybe what I forgot to tell you is that normally Jesse Hernandez, chairman of the PSC User Council, should have uh, presented this, but unfortunately wasn't able to attend today. So. I'm Stefan Bicure from the VSC operational team, and I will try to guide you through our uh, lunch session today. Well, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Lila Kiapa Kolosar from the Von Kerman Institute for Fluid Dynamics. And Lila, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I have a bit of a problem because I don't see where to share my, my slides. And I know that we tried this out, but I just don't see. Ah, now I can, it just popped up. So 
So I hope that you can see my, my screen. This is something that I don't really see anymore. Uh, so let me introduce myself. I'm Lila uh, Kapakolosar. I'm a research expert at the Von Karman Institute. And today I will show you uh, how HPC and open foam can be used in, to have the design of the thermal hydraulics of advanced nuclear uh, reactors. The work that I will show is, uh, as you can see in the slide, is a summary of uh, the work of many people, uh, both from the von Karman Institute and the SEKC and the Belgian Nuclear Research Center. So uh, before I get into the topic, let me introduce you the von Karman Institute and the SEKC. And so the von Karman Institute is a um, NATO associated uh, research institute uh, that was funded in 1956 by, uh, by Professor Karman. Um, and the idea behind the institute is uh, to uh, enhance collaboration between uh, NATO countries, the scientists of the NATO countries. Um, and uh, the motto of our institute is uh, teaching research through research. So as indeed it's in our name, uh, we are dealing with fluid dynamics only. But this work that I'm showing was uh, initiated uh, by the Budget Nuclear Research Center, SEKC, and uh, who is um, uh, doing research in uh, many nuclear applications. And uh, one of them is uh, the design and hopefully soon the operation of uh, the next generation research reactor, MIRA. So uh, MIRA is a, a research reactor uh, that is aimed at uh, demonstrate uh, the transmutation, uh, which is uh, um, a mechanism to reduce uh, the half time of nuclear waste of common power reactors, uh, which is now around 100,000 years. And through transmutation, uh, it's possible to reduce it uh, to more human manageable times, uh, something like uh, several, a few thousand to a few hundred years. Now, transportation by itself was already demonstrated that can work, however, only in laboratory scale. And the Mira reactor is aiming to do this in full scale and uh, such way it was process the nuclear waste of current nuclear reactors. Uh, the Mira reactor is still under design and uh, WKI is uh, helping uh, in the design of the cooling loop, the primary cooling loop. Uh, what I didn't say up to now is that uh, the mirror reactor is cooled actually with uh, liquid metal that is called uh, lead based metal technique. The reason to use liquid metal in the cooling of this reactor, uh, which is rather unconventionally because most of the power reactors are either cooled by water or by gas, uh, is the fact that uh, a research reactor that uh, should be able to do a transmutation has a very compact core. Uh, and uh, with a extremely high energy fluxes. So uh, the efficient cooling is necessary to keep uh, the reactor in safe operation. Liquid metals has a very high thermal conductivity allowing to uh, such kind of uh, efficient cooling. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, we know much less about liquid metals and their flow and thermal uh, behavior compared to more usual uh, liquids such as water or gas. This is mainly because liquid metals are opaque. Uh, therefore, any kind of measurement technique we have developed up to now in science uh, that based on optical access cannot be applied here. They are usually rather hot. Metals are uh, most of the metals at least uh, solid in room temperature. So this metal technique becomes liquid somewhere around 150 degrees, which is rather low uh, melting point, uh, while most of the metals is above 1000. As I already said, they have very high thermal conductivity, which, le which leads to very low frontal number. Uh, they have very low kinematic viscosity that leads in most of the flow, very high Reynolds number, and they have large surface tension. If you ever had the opportunity to break an old uh, thermometer, uh, you could have seen mercury, which is liquid in room temperature, forming very nice spheres, and this is due to the high surface tension. Uh, while, of course, like water is splashing all around. So this is the uh, fluid that uh, we are dealing with for uh, in nuclear reactors of MIRA. When we want to use uh, CFD, 
for design of a new system which has such high safety standards as a nuclear reactor, uh, it's of utmost important to demonstrate that the CFD tool that we are using is capable to predict such profits. This is actually a four-step uh, process. Uh, we start usually with the basic uh, modeling uh, to develop uh, the turbulence models, for example, or just the CFDS in general. And this is done uh, most of the time through direct numerical simulation. Direct numerical simulation is, the, is a simulation approach that has the least modeling involved. Indeed, it's just the numerical uh, discretization that is affecting the accuracy of the simulation. Therefore, it's considered as numerical experiments uh, and uh, can be used as reference data for turbulence modeling, both in thermal and momentum field. However, uh, due to the scale that are involved in a turbulent flow, you can see it in the slide, all the large scale circulation of, for example, this impinging jet and the very, very tiny structures all around uh, in this jet. And when you do direct numerical simulation, it's necessary uh, to resolve all these scales by the mesh, resulting in very huge meshes, even for simple cases. When we move on, um, we can uh, build scaled mockups. These are level two and level three in this slide. Um, for example, when we take the mirror simulation, we have uh, right now um, a scaled down mockup both with water and with lead based metal graphic. The reason for to have both. Uh, is that in water we can use all the optical techniques. Therefore, we can analyze uh, the, the flow field and the flow structures in the pool system uh, with all the optical techniques, including PIV or LDV or any other. But when you make uh, experiments or simulations with water, the drawback is that water has a very high frontal number, somewhere around seven. Uh, so the thermal behavior is completely different than the one of LBE, which has a frontal number of 0 0.025 or around. And uh, therefore, the thermal behavior in such mockups is not, uh, re not representing well the one that would, will be in the reactor. Uh, therefore, uh, scaled experiments uh, with the same a cooling liquid that in plant for the reactor is necessary and therefore we uh, deal with as well in the design procedure with scale experiments with LD. Before and these all three levels are building up the trust uh, that we would like to later uh, use to simulate uh, the mirror reactor because the mirror reactor is not yet available and even if it were measurements in an active nuclear reactor is extremely difficult, especially uh, with high resolution space and time. So let me now walk through you all these four steps uh, that we are parallel, parallel taking uh, to design, to help the design of the reactor. So the first one is the validation of post-thermal and momentum turbulence model based on direct numerical simulation. Now, open form is very rarely used for direct numerical simulation, mainly because it's a low order model Therefore, it's a bit less accurate for moving it around. You need an extremely high, much higher uh, mesh resolution to capture the same physics than what you can capture with a high order uh, numerical method. So what we are doing is that we are using a higher order uh, numerical method for these academic cases um, to do the direct numerical simulation. And then we use open form or final design tool uh, to validate the turbulence models in the RANS framework most of the time. Um, and such we uh, show that in these, these turbulence models are able to capture low frontal number thermal turbulence. So what you can see here in this graph is two demonstrative cases, one of the channel flow and the other one is an impinging jet. So focusing on the channel flow, this is the simplest ever configuration that you can have after decaying turbulence. Uh, you have a parallel flow and uh, you, you hit uh, the two sides and therefore you can uh, get the thermal gradient uh, within the channel flow. Um, this kind of flow is called forced convection, meaning that the momentum field and the thermal field is completely detached. Uh, and therefore, once we get a full uh, and accurate 
uh, momentum field, we can try out the different uh, thermal models um, and cross compare them. Now, most of the thermal turbulence models were developed again for water and air. Therefore, their um, applicability for low quantum number is questionable. And that makes this exercise uh, so important. In the last decade uh, or so, uh, special thermal turbulence uh, models were uh, developed for low quantum number fluids. And indeed, as can be uh, shown here, these turbulence models like the algebraic heat flux model or uh, the massive Wiesel model can capture low quantum number flows much, much better. Uh, but it comes with a price. These models are usually more complex. And uh, as they were so-called tuned for low quantum numbers, most of the time they are not working so well uh, for higher quantum numbers. And that is the current research to make them as universal as possible. Uh, another example that I would like to say is the impinging jet. Here we tried as well the different turbulence models. And what we could show is actually if the momentum model is not captured well, here you see the DNS and two different momentum transport. It does not matter what thermal turbulence model we are using. The impact of the accuracy of the thermal uh, turbulence model is much less than of the momentum. Indeed, uh, thermal turbulence is driven by the momentum turbulence, and the two things, even if we are using force convection, cannot be entirely detached. Now, moving to natural convection is even more uh, difficult. Natural convection flows are driven by buoyancy. So the thermal field is, uh, the momentum field is a consequence of uh, the thermal field. Uh, and therefore they are inherently coupled. So if you have some mistakes in the turbulence modeling and the thermal, they are uh, enhancing each other or cancel out sometimes. But this is something that cannot be known in advance. Therefore, a severe validation in uh, natural convection, different natural convection flows is currently undertaken to increase the level of predictability in natural convection flows. Um, new turbulence models are less and less developed because we already have a huge variety of different approaches. Uh, but, uh, and now the focus uh, in the research community is more to make them more, let's say, robust uh, and general. However, um, as was mentioned just in the introduction, AI is a field that is uh, currently taking off um, and used more and more in fluid dynamics. Uh, and it can be used as well uh, on direct numerical simulation data to build up uh, um, a new turbulence for the through neural network. And uh, this is another research field that we are uh, taking in Pona. And you can see the person who is responsible to this research. So you will always have the person at VKI who is who you can contact in case you have more interest uh, on the slide, on the bottom of the slide. So uh, in this case, we are not using DNS only for validation, but we are using it as well of, let's say, constructing a model that can capture uh, thermal turbulence modeling. And uh, our first experience that indeed uh, using neural network uh, is a viable way of thermal turbulence modeling. However, one has to really take care that the physics is captured right, because a computer is nothing but a computer. So it will try to fit to the DNS data, uh, the simulation, but it will never know what does it mean, uh, the laws of thermodynamics and so on. So when we design these models, we have to ensure that all these physical constraints are taken into account, uh, such that when we go for extrapolation, uh, we still have the embedded properties that turbulence itself represents. Now let's move on for bigger scale problems, because these were really small scale problem with more Reynolds number, low level of turbulence. So the next step of validation is uh, to look at water modeling. So the Mirabal facility is a one-fifth scale uh, plexiglass model uh, of the mirror reactor, the version 1.2 design. And uh, it was designed based on the Richardson number similarity. The Richardson number is a number that is representing um, whether we are in forced convection or natural convection or mixed convection regime. And uh, with this setup, we try to um, represent all of them uh, depending on the flow rate. So here you can see uh, the design itself. It's practically taking uh, like a full scale down of the middle reactor. Uh, but instead of having a nuclear core, of course, we have uh, an electric core here. 
um, the flow is going from the, through the pumps, pushed to the uh, bottom, going up in the core, then going out uh, to the above core through the heat exchangers back to the pump. So that's the usual flow field in the middle reactor and then all the mock-ups. So in this case, we can use PIV and LIF uh, to, me to measure um, in high resolution uh, both the momentum and the thermal field. Uh, we still measure the thermal field, even we know that it's, it will not um, be representative to MIRA, uh, because it still helps the validation of the turbulence models in water. Um, here you can see uh, some simulations, both for nominal and uh, reduced uh, mass flow uh, cases, and this we comp and the, thermal, the, the corresponding thermal field. And one very interesting experience that we had that uh, the, let's see, the thermal response of water and plexiglass is extremely uh, far away. Uh, and therefore, we were thinking that the thermal inertia of the solids might be not important here. And uh, in the num earlier numerical models, we did not include it uh, in the simulations to reduce, of course, uh, the, the computational cost as much as possible. But then when we compared to the measurements, we had to see that in some regions, especially very close uh, to, to this region, where you have a high temperature gradient, uh, our, ex our experiments were uh, predicting higher temperatures than in numerics. And uh, therefore, we, we had to include uh, the conjugate heat transfer, even in the water simulations. Now, um, the mesh of the, Mira, uh, of the uh, Mirabel uh, setup is relatively small, so it's not really needing HPC at this sense. And that is simply due to the fact that the core is very simple. It's just some tubes uh, and such. So with this 25 million cells, we could represent very well, uh, plus the 3 million in the solid regions, uh, the case. But we are here today uh, to talk about HPC. Now, this is the one fifth model, and now I will move on to the uh, one sixth model, so even smaller uh, setup, but with LD. So, the SK facility is, is um, the one sixth model, as I said already, of the mirror reactor. It's representing the same design uh, as Mirabel, though there are some technological things that have to be considered. Uh, the pumps and the heat exchangers are not anymore submerged uh, in the pool uh, because they are much higher uh, to fit in. So they uh, are installed in a full piping system around uh, the vessel that you can see here. This setup is not at Wikia, it's at SEKTN. Furthermore, the core is much more complex uh, than in Mirabel. Uh, in order to really represent the core of uh, the nuclear reactor. It's still electric heated, um, but you can see that in, even in the above core, we have the same dense structure that the fuel assemblies are, or the above core structure of the middle reactor would, would have. But this has a consequence. It is a reduced scale model. Uh, the diameter is like 1.4 meter uh, of the pool of escape, but in the core, the geometrical de details are sub-millimeter. And this disparity in scales that makes the simulation of nuclear reactors so hard and the need for HPC. So um, before even trying to mesh the whole system, we did uh, a mesh convergence study just first on the nuclear core. Here you can see um, the escape core and with all the details and plates uh, in order to get the right pressure drop uh, in the system that is representative for the mirror reactor. So uh, we simulated this with um, many levels of refinement in order to capture the flow field correctly. And the, uh, whether it's captured or not was measured through the pressure drop that was uh, obtained by the experiments as well as through the core. And um, the design of the full mesh of the escape was actually uh, started from uh, the core and then propagated outward. And the, the one that can capture all the different um, mass flow uh, scenarios, uh, and we ended up with somewhere around 322 uh, million cells. 
And you can imagine that this is a cell count that even for a steady state simulation needs HPC. So uh, in SK, we can only compare uh, the thermal field. And here you can see a cross comparison through measurements and, uh, and the numerical simulation with different uh, flow rates and scenarios. And we did several simulations uh, of different uh, setups uh, to show that uh, the CFD simulation can follow very well the modification of the flow structure in uh, this mocha. We also simulated natural convection. As I told already, natural convection is always so much more difficult than forced convection because you cannot decouple the flow field from the temperature field. Um, and what we could show here, though this is an ongoing work, is uh, we were measuring uh, the, um, the thermal field both inside the core and above the core. And while we could capture rather well uh, um, right above the core, we had more discrepancies um, in, the, in the above core. Uh, we did use different thermal turbulence models to see which one can capture better. But what we show eventually is uh, that it was measured in one line in SK uh, with thermocouple. Uh, but in CFD, we can obtain the radial distribution uh, of this temperature field. And what we could see that the radial distribution is eventually give a higher variation in the temperature field than the change of turbulence models. So with this, we can uh, presume that in this natural convection case, we have thermal plumes emerging from the core. And uh, therefore, the delta T and the prediction of delta T with a steady state case is rather difficult. And with that, I arrived to the last part of my presentation, uh, which is about the simulation of the operating condition of the mirror reactor. So this is out of the proof into the trust. So uh, the mirror reactor is like 10 meter high and nine meter of diameter. It's a huge pool. Uh, of a lot of liquid metal inside. It will be around 4,000 tons once it will be filled with LB. Um, so it's really a very impressive system. Here you can see how the meshing is uh, done. Uh, since it's such a huge uh, and complex uh, geometry, we really would benefit, we are benefiting uh, with parallel meshing and automatic mesh generation. This was done with open foam snappy hex mesh. Uh, and uh, we experienced that we need a very good STL resolution to capture uh, both the fluid flow and the solids, because here conjugate heat transfer is necessary uh, due to the, the same activity ratio, I mean, the activity ratio, thermal activity ratio between LBE and the steel is very close, which is around one. And um, moreover, we have to take into account uh, the temperature dependent uh, properties of lipids and delta-active because temperature range that we are dealing with the reactor is around 400 uh, degree. We can still use incompressible solver uh, as liquid metals are not really compressible in the range. We are using atmospheric conditions, uh, but we have to take into account the strongly uh, temperature dependent material. So no constant density here or viscosity or anything like that. Uh, the mirror reactor can be uh, distributed to several subsystems. Uh, this is needed because we cannot, at this scale, not even with HPC, uh, simulate every uh, subsist subsystems of this reactor uh, as it is. For example, in the pumps, not in Escape or Mirabel either, but uh, not in Mira, we don't simulate the rotating. Um, rotating uh, system. Instead of that, in these simulations, the flow is driven by the momentum source put where the rotor would be. And we prescribe the mass flow that we would like to have. Then um, the heat exchangers are uh, not simulated in that geometrical detail either. Uh, but instead of that, we use a porous approach that is representing both, both the heat sink and the pressure drop uh, due to the um, heat exchanger tubes. 
And we are using the Ushakov correlation uh, to have a contra flow heat exchanger. So. Then uh, another simplification that we are uh, doing that in around the core, there is actually an isolated uh, liquid pool. This is kind of like a dead zone. It's not uh, part of the flow that I already explained. Uh, and here we use, instead of a fluid, most of the time a solid LB with the, LB, with the properties of a, a fluid LB to reduce the computational cost. And finally, in the simulations of operating condition, where the levels of LB is constant, we don't simulate the covert gas above. Uh, now, one thing that I did not say that we have this diaphragm here. And uh, in the core, we have a pressure drop of 2.5 bar, more or less. And therefore, in the uh, outer side so, uh, of um, the reactor and the inner side, you have this 2.5 bar, which results in 2.5 meter of uh, level difference in operating condition, given that uh, the density of air is around 10 kilograms per cubic meter. So these are already some considerations uh, that an engineer has to do uh, when um, simulating such a system as the mirror reactor. And of course, this has consequences. Now, uh, the last subsystem that I would like to talk about is the core. Obviously, this is the core of a nuclear reactor. Uh, so its modeling needs to be as detailed as possible. But modeling a full reactor core is not even in the fuel assembly level is possible right now. Mira has around, um, well, the latest design, uh, 63 uh, positions. And each position of fuel assembly, as we call, has 127 pins inside. So uh, that's why it has such a huge pressure drop. But besides the pressure drop, the whole point of Mira is, of course, the production of, uh, of heat, production of energy. And uh, this production due to the radiation in the core is not uniform at all. It has a radial distribution and an axial distribution as well, which is a half cosine. Uh, moreover, we have different sections. Uh, in the outside, we have the outer dummies. These are positions which are usually not filled as, uh, with fuel, um, except when we are in the critical mode. But Mira is planned to operate mainly on subcritical mode, and then it's not operate, then it's not filled. Then uh, we have the inner dummies, and that is depending on whether you are at the end of cycle or beginning of cycle or in the middle of the cycle, they are either filled with fuel assemblies or not. Then the inner uh, fuel assemblies, uh, these are always filled, and the outer, these are always filled with, uh, with fuel. And then you have the impact section and the control roads and such, uh, which are helping the operation, the safe operation of the reactor. And while they are irradiated, they are producing heat, but obviously much less uh, than the fuel assembly. And then we have as well uh, some other sections of the core to be represented. But this, what I show here, is only a numerical representation, and we try to make it as good as it's possible. But again, these are engineering decisions to be made. And in the numerical uh, field, uh, we drive uh, this representation to reach the same mass flow distribution and heat distribution as close as possible of the real core. Uh, and these are the results that we can more or less obtain. Uh, we can study and we can look. It's kind of looking behind the curtain because uh, even if, as I said, the mirror reactor will be built, we will never be able to see the flow structure uh, in the pool, in the operating uh, conditions, or the thermal uh, structures. So this is the nominal operation that you can see. And again, you can see that the pump is driving the flow towards the core, going through the core, and then going to the upper plane, on, entering to the heat exchangers that are out of plane, and getting back uh, to the core. And um, when it comes to the design, uh, actually, what we provide to SDK CDN is the temp temperature distributions because the temperature distribution will drive um, the sizing of the reactor components against thermal fatigue. And it is not just the gradient that we have to give, but also 
the fluctuations. Of course, rainwater average of these stocks can only approximate the fluctuations of temperature as it's a steady state approach, but it's still much, much better than nothing. Uh, and and make, using just empirical correlations that was derived not for liquid matter reactors because we don't have much uh, operating right now. And uh, finally, uh, we are moving uh, towards the uh, accidental scenario. So what you can see here is a loss of flow accident, meaning that the pumps for electrical backout or anything like that uh is um failing to operate in this case uh first the cooling is reduced therefore the reactor is uh, heating up but after the de that due to the high temperature gradient the natural convection flow is establishing and uh that is called the so-called passive uh safety system uh thanks to the high um thermal conductivity of uh, liquid matter. This is happening rather fast and always ensuring the safe operation uh, of the reactor and the efficient cooling of the core, even in accidents. So with that, I arrive to the closing remarks. Uh, why do we need HPC? Um, should, sh should we be able to simulate such kind of thing uh, without HPC? And the answer is yes, of course. We can simulate a nuclear reactor without HPC. But the modifications, the simplifications we have to do is just so high that our predictivity is reduced uh, by using less computational power. Mesh is like 280 million or even higher. Even in steady state condition, it's not possible anymore to simulate this in one workstation. Not even a workstation that are having 128 or 64 CPUs. Uh, these simulations need massively parallel computations. Even more when we go to accidental scenarios or transient scenarios um, uh, to be captured and show that indeed our system is capable of stable operation with the different um, accidents. Uh, or if we show that they are not. In this design phase, there is still possible to intervene and modify the design um, in advance. And uh, finally, I would like to uh, draw your attention that HPC by itself is never enough. You cannot just rely that you are that okay. We have data centers where we can use more and more cores, so we can simulate uh, bigger and bigger problems. We should always be aware of the technological advancement, uh, both in the side of fluid dynamics and CFD and in computer science. Uh, this is a comparison that I would like to show. It's not with CFD. The gain with CFD would be much less than what you can see in slides. This is with machine learning, uh, which is, of course, better suited to GPU. But the same comparison can be done as well for um, CFD simulations. Uh, and there you can still gain at least five to 10 uh, times faster simulations. And indeed, today, OpenFOAM is ported partially already to GPU. Uh, and I would urge you uh, to help this development and uh, look into it. So move towards GPU for faster agreement. And to conclude my uh, presentation, I would like to draw as well your attention to the academic programs, uh, to all the students that VKI is offering, uh, both for undergraduate and uh, graduate level. We can find more information uh, about this on our website. And with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. And uh, I honestly do not know if we have time now for questions or rather uh, at the end of the session. Thank you, Lila, for your uh, presentation. There were no questions posted so far, but I would invite all participants, if questions will pop up during the next talks, feel free to put them in the chat and we can have a look at it afterwards. I will do so. so. Thank you very much. So we'll go to our next speaker, which is Florian Véry from the University of Ghent Laboratory for Chemical Technology.
Oh, sorry. I'm trying to share my screen, but I don't see which screen I'm sharing right now. So you, you're sharing the presenter notes, but you can just display settings uh -huh. and then, yeah, okay, now yes. it's okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, okay. Yes, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Dorian Berry, and I'm a fourth year PhD student at Labrador Chemical Technology at Ghent University. And today I'm going to talk a little more about my research topic, which is uh, CFDDM model development in OpenFOAM. Uh, furthermore, we'll look into some validation and uh, application cases uh, in, within the Gauss Solid Floor Extractor, but more on that later. So let me start with some background on why fluidization is important and what types of uh, Gauss Solid CFD exist. And afterwards, we'll go into some validation studies in a bed for heat transfer and in a fact bed for our developed reactive framework. Afterwards, I will go uh, into the bulk of the stock and this will handle the Gauss Solid Floor Extractor. But we will discuss both the validation case and the bed hydrodynamics uh, to be discussed. This will hopefully convince you that the GSVR is a good candidate for a chemical process called oxidative coupling of methane, or OCM in short. Uh, but don't worry about that process uh, too much for now. And then I will end with some uh, proof of concept uh, reactive GSVR simulations. Uh, so first, some background. Why would one uh, bother with fluidizing uh, a catalyst, so why even uh, add a catalyst in the first place? Catalysis is a, is a field of chemical engineering that uh, is crucial to transform the chemical industry in a more sustainable and uh, efficient uh, industry. Catalysis allows us to favor certain uh, chemical reactions and increase the process yields uh, of several uh, yeah, important processes in, in chemistry currently, such as, for example, fruit catalytic cracking, reforming, or it's also used in ammonia production and the pharmaceutical production. These processes are right now mostly being carried out mostly in, uh, in fact bed reactors, but when a uh, mass of heat transfer uh, becomes a dominate the limiting factor, uh, most of the time fluidite bed reactors are used, of which a picture is shown here on the right. Uh, when uh, developing such a, or uh, designing such a reactor in industry, mostly uh, still simplified reactor models are used. Uh, or right now also CFDS will be discussed in the next talk. Um, but we in academia, we more often than not use completion fluid dynamics to get insight to the whole uh, complete geometry, the flow field inside the complete geometry. So gas solid CFD can be performed in two distinct different ways, uh, either Euler Euler or Euler Lagrange. In Euler Euler, the Navier Stokes equations are solved for both phases, and the solid is as modeled as a continuum. In order to close the different governing equations of a solid phase, the kinetic theory uh, for general flow is applied, which is a collection of empirical correlations. This, for example, attributes uh, viscosity to the solid phase. On the other hand, Euler Lagrange uh, retains the discrete character of the particles and allows us to track the trajectory of each particle individually via force balance, as is done in the discrete element method, or DEM in short, hence the name CFD DEM. Um, herein, the interparticle forces are modeled via collision models, um, where the collisions between particles are modeled via spring coefficients and uh, damping coefficients. So, that was some very short background. Now we'll go into some validation studies. But before we can really talk about validating our model, we, know, we need to know what is happening. So, uh, a little bit about the governing equations, which can for some people be the most interesting part and for some the least. Uh, so, what's extremely important in gas solid CFD is accurately accounting for the presence of the particle phase. And this is done by adding void fractions, uh, denoted by alpha g at different locations uh, within the uh, balance equations. Momentum transfer between the gas and the solid phase is accounted for via the momentum transfer coefficient, KSL, which is a summation of the different forces of the gas acting on the particles, which are in my case, drag force, pressure gradient force, and viscous forces. At the particle side, uh, Newton's second law of motion is solved to determine the position and the velocity of each individual particle. Um, as I mentioned before, interparticle collisions are uh, characterized by a spring coefficient and a damping coefficient. And these coefficients are determined based on particle properties, such as the uh, material properties, excuse me, uh, such as the Young's modulus. All CFD-DM simulations 
that I will present here are performed in an open source extension of uh, OpenCom called CFDM coupling. Uh, this, this code is freely available on GitHub and, is, and has the same file format as, as OpenFoam. It's basically just a new set of libraries that you compile uh, next to your OpenFoam version. Um, CFDM coupling couples the DM solver lights with the CFD solver OpenFoam. And in my research, I have modified uh, a lot of things at the CFDM coupling sites uh, to account for heat transfer and uh, to facilitate chemical reactions. And I hope to make this code also publicly available on GitHub in the near future. So after validation of the hydrodynamics uh, inside of fluidized beds, uh, which I'm not showing here in view of time, uh, we incorporated an energy balance. In this energy balance, it's also important to account for the presence of particles. And we're doing that by uh, once again adding void fractions and working with the effective thermal conductivity, which is calculated yeah, based on void fractions. Um, in this energy balance, there are also two source zones present, one of which uh, the first one accounts for convective heat transfer between gas and solid uh, phases, and the second one accounts for uh, reaction heat, uh, originating from both homogeneous gas phase reactions and from heterogeneously catalyzed reactions at the surface of a particle. Uh, the amount of heat transfer, uh, the amount of convective heat transfer between gas and solid is determined by the Kuhn correlation. Um, we validated our energy framework uh, by comparing uh, experimental data gathered by Patil with our CFD-DM simulations, where we cooled down hot particles, which were loaded at 90 degrees C uh, inside a fluidized wet, and cooled down by a gas at 20 degrees C at different uh, inlet velocities. Other the dimensions of the beds and other simulation conditions are shown here on the left, and the obtained results are shown here on this plot. The solid line is our model performance for three different gas inlet velocities, while the dots are experimental data. So at higher gas inlet velocities, more heat is transferred from the solids to the gas, and uh, yeah, temperature is uh, lowering more quickly. So there's a clear uh, match between our uh, CFD DM results and the experimental data. In the experimental setup, there's a, there was a spout nozzle present, which occupied around 10% of the gas in the plane, through which uh, no gas is fed. This is accounted for in our meshing of the geometry. Uh, this movie here on the right shows how particles are being cooled down in real time. So you can clearly see that a string of cold particles is formed in the middle of the bed, originating from our spout nozzle, through which no gas flows. Um, particles above the spout nozzle remain the longest, close to the inlet, just transferring more heat to, to, to the gas phase. This is also clearly visible in these snapshots at one, five, and uh, 10 seconds of simulated time. The temperature distribution obtained from simulations on top and experiments on the bottom uh, also correspond very well. Uh, the slightly more narrow peaks obtained during our simulations uh, can be explained via the initialization of our particle temperature field. Uh, of course, in a simulation, it's easy to to attribute one temperature to, to all of your particles, while this is not possible uh, in the experimental setup. And the tail towards lower uh, temperature originates from the presence of the spout nozzle, which is also visible both in simulations and experiments. Um, so after we validated our energy framework, I was confident enough to, to introduce species balances into the CFD-DM model, and herein, uh, next to an accumulation term, a convection term, and a diffusion term, two source terms are added, uh, accounting for both homogeneous reactions in the gas phase and heterogeneously catalyzed reactions on the particle surface. Uh, important to note is that gas species mass fractions, denoted by Y-E uh, for species I, um, are stored per cell, while surface coverages uh, are stored per particle. So the source term originating from heterogeneously catalyzed reactions is summation over all particles uh, inside the cell. So now I can introduce uh, the chemical process called oxidative coupling of methane, or OCM in short. Um, and this is a cat an heterogeneously catalyzed process where methane uh, is catalytically converted in the presence of oxygen towards ethane and ethylene. Um, however, temperature control and a narrow residence time distribution is uh, very important due to the exothermic nature of the process. 
also um, undesired secondary reactions can occur which uh, which transform our reactant or one of our desired products towards CO and CO2. This of course needs to be kept to a minimum. One can imagine that uh, such reactive CFD DM type of simulations are very time consuming. This is also why we, why we need HPC. So the species equations add a total of 30 new partial differential equations to the system plus a computational cost related to the determination of all source terms. Um, and that's because yeah, those 30 equations stem from the 30 gas species that, uh, that are present in the kinetic model we're using. Therefore, I looked at methods to lower this cost and we implemented two of them, um, one called particle agglomeration and another called in-situ adaptive tabulation. Um, particle agglomeration sorts particles into a user-defined number of bins based on an index uh, yeah, following this formula summating over all particle variables um, which includes surface coverages, mass fractions of the gas species in the gas nearby, pressure and temperature per bin. Chemistry is solved for only once based on the average values of these variables and uh, afterwards after solving for the chemistry the, this, this value is then mapped back to each particle side set up. Um, ISET reduces the computational time required to solve the chemistry by working in a multidimensional table. So upon solving chemistry, the input and the output is stored inside this table. And once a term of physical composition, uh, very similar to an already encountered one, uh, is found in the simulation, we can simply retrieve the solution from this table and omit the, the solution of this chemistry uh, solver. So, to validate, we used an isothermal backbed case in which heat transfer was completely turned off. To validate our reactive framework, um, particles positions were fixed so that we can compare the output of our CFD DM simulation to the output of an ideal plug flow uh, reactor simulation obtained by, via the kinetic modeling software Cantera. Uh, simulation conditions are shown here. And the kinetic model uh, comprised of 29 gas phase species and 11 surface species was used. I will not go further into the details since it's not the essence of this talk, but we can see that uh, our reactants and our product composition is very, yeah, corresponds very well to what uh, would be expected from this kinetic model. Um, so this is both a good fit for our case without speedup and for different combinations of our speedup algorithms. And for example, um, combining both of these speedup algorithms together um, reduces the, the time needed to obtain the chemistry solution by factor 100. So this is a really yeah, important thing to include in these CFD-DM simulations since computation time would otherwise not be feasible. Uh, this small discrepancy in uh, ethane production between uh, our CFD-DM results and Cantera um, is related to the, the, the size of our, our time step. When lowering this time step, um, this discrepancy lowers. But uh, yeah, I show these results because these are also the time steps that are used in GSVR simulations that I show later on. As I mentioned before, there's also a source term present in the energy equation uh, accounting for uh, reaction heat. Therefore, we performed an adiabatic simulation in the same pack bed. And top left shows the temperature evolution of our simulation results versus the exact solution uh, in Cantera, to which good agreement is found once again. Um, good agreement is also found for our reactants and our products. And these adiabatic simulations can now also be sped up via IZ, but I'm still debugging the implementation of uh, particle agglomeration in adiabatic CFDDM, since this is research, some projects are still ongoing. And um, once again, this is a uh, small discrepancy at the highest temperature lowers when we choose a smaller time set in these simulations. But these are the ones I'm using for my GSVR simulation. So these are the results I'm showing now. So now we get to the uh, second topic of this talk, which I hinted at before, the gas solid vortex reactor. And this is the reactor designed at our lab in view of process intensification where instead of working in the gravitational fields, fluidization is uh, obtained in the centrifugal field. 
And this allows to work in a more compact reactor and intensifies the uh, heat and mass transfer between both phases. The working principle is as follows. Uh, solid catalyst is loaded within the central reactor chamber and the tangentially inclined inlet slots are present to introduce the gas. Uh, momentum transfer from gas to particles then makes the bed start to rotate. So yeah, introducing a centrifugal field, uh, centrifugal bed. Several experimental and modeling studies have been performed before. Um, these modeling studies have primarily focused on Euler, Euler modeling and experimentally particle image velocity symmetry or PIV in short has been used to capture particle velocity profiles both radially and azimutally near the bottom plate of the GSVR. And this data is uh, used to validate our CFD DM model in the GSVR geometry. So how are these simulations performed? Um, God's particles are introduced in eight different wedges uh, at an initial azimuthal velocity of five meters per second. Um, the GSVR geometry has a diameter of 80 millimeters and a reactor height of 15 millimeters. Um, all simulation conditions are shown here top right. Um, in order to get close to the experimental uh, results, we, we varied our particle wall restitution coefficient um, based on data found in literature, which was between values of 0 0.2 and 0 0.6. And after some trial and error, um, a value of 0 0.3 gave rise to the best results. So this slide shows a comparison of the simulated on top and the experimental uh, particle uh, velocities for both azimuthal direction and the radial direction. Um, Gas insults are present at 0, 45, and 90 degrees on these figures. And the largest particle as mutual velocities are encountered right after passing an inlet slot, while a slowdown of particles is observed right before the next inlet slot. This occurs due to particle buildup and the jet like behavior of the, of the gas. I will come back on this buildup later. Uh, the radial velocity is defined as follows a negative value implies that particles move really inwards, while the inverse holds for a positive value. Particles are pushed really inwards uh, when passing an inlet slot, after which they start to move radially outwards again, as is to be expected. Even though there is some uh, discrepancy in absolute values between experiments and simulations, there's still a clear qualitative validation. And this is also visible uh, in velocity profiles at uh, different radial positions. So this radial position at 37 millimeters uh, corresponds to, to build bed behavior, while the radial position of 39 millimeters corresponds to the behavior uh, near the end wall of the reactor. Um, also here, some minor over and under predictions are visible, but the global trends uh, perform very well. On these figures, also some data from other restitution coefficients is shown, but only the value of 0 0.3 uh, is interesting. Let me quickly mark that uh, while there are some discrepancies, there are also areas in which our model performs very well, um, and it actually captures all uh, aspects of our uh, fluidization regime. So here at 37 millimeters, for example, there's a small stagnation occurring at the radial velocity, followed by a large drop, which is also captured in our CRD DM model. And the same uh, holds at 39 millimeters. There's also a small rise or stagnation followed by a larger drop. So how, does, how do particles move within GSVR? There's a, there's a global view of our GSVR here, where the particles are col colored based on the particle volume fraction uh, within the CFD cell they reside in. And there's a clear impact from gravity, resulting in a thicker bed at the bottom uh, compared to the top. This is also visualized in these three uh, 2D plots at one 7.5 and 14 millimeters of uh, reactive height. And here on the bottom right of the slide, there are some profiles of the particle volume fraction at two different radial positions, 37 millimeters in blue and 39 millimeters, uh, 37 millimeters in red, sorry, and 39 millimeters in blue. So near the wall, there's a much more uniform, uh, much more uniform profile of the particle volume fraction along the reactor height. Well, this is not present in uh, 37 millimeters. So in the bulk of the bed, the bed is more dense uh, near the bottom of the GSVR compared to the top, and also thicker in this region. So I mentioned before that temperature control and uh, narrow resistance time distribution 
are very important for OCM. And now I'm going to show you why the GSQR is an ideal reactor candidate. So particle backmixing and uh, the thermal inertia related to the exothermic surface reactions could provide already heated particles near the inlet slot, meaning that uh, hot particles are present near the cold gas uh, at the inlet. And this is, of course, only possible if particle movement within the bed is very turbulent. The top of the slide shows a movement of a single particle through the bed over a couple of seconds and moving from very close to the wall to the, to the, edge, to the inner edge of the bed and back again multiple times per second. And this is also visible in, in these two movies. On the left, the particles are colored based on their ID, so based on the order they were inserted into the reactor. Each frame of this, of this movie corresponds to one millisecond of uh, simulated time. So even after one second uh, in real time, or 14 seconds here, uh, that, that initial structure is completely broken and very turbulent mixing of the particles is, is found. This is also visible here, where it's slowed down uh, in time even more. So yeah, this is 10 milliseconds for every second of movie. And the particles here uh, are colored in red when they reside between 38 and 39 millimeters and are colored in blue uh, otherwise. And also here, when I start the movie, you can clearly see that particles directly move, uh, move out from this region and mix well with, with the other particles. So this proves that very intense particle mixing is, is present inside the GSGR and thermal inertia or particle back mixing, uh, it could be achieved. So all that I previously mentioned was related to the particles inside the GSVR, but a lot of the benefits to the gas load vortex reactor are also related to the gas phase hydrodynamics. Um, from the streamlines shown here, it's clear that the gas phase transferred almost 90% of its momentum to the particles, um, lowering the amount of rotation one would expect when tangentially in introducing the, the gas. So it's very limited rotation. Uh, which corresponds to a very narrow resonance time distribution, which is very favorable for OCM, since this way secondary reactions can be suppressed and its oxidation to CO and CO2 is, is lowered. Um, heat and mass transfer is also characterized by the difference in velocity between the gas and the solid phase, by uh, so-called slip velocity. And the thermal falling velocity of the particles considered here uh, is 3.4 meters per second which is also the maximum velocity gas can be injected into a gravitational fluid ice bed before particle entrainment occurs. And it's clear that in the GSVR, um, yeah, this limit is clearly over uh, surpassed in many different areas of the units, showing that high heat and mass transfer is obtained. So I hope that what I previously showed convinced you that the CFDDM uh, well, this is a very powerful tool when validated, and that the GSVR is indeed a good candidate for OCM, uh, both due to its excellent heat transfer characteristics and a low resonance time distribution. In this last part, I'll present some preliminary results of an isothermal reactor study in the GSVR. However, simulation results uh, shown here are other proof of concept, with which I mean they are not performed at the ideal. Uh, reactive conditions, but at a rather conservative temperatures, lowering the reaction rate uh, to ensure stability. So we're working at a temperature of 1048 Kelvin in two different geometries, uh, one equipped with eight slots and another one equipped with 16 slots. Um, there's also a clearly dip, a large difference between the hydrodynamics achieved at these larger temperatures uh, compared to the hydrodynamics I showed previously at ambient temperatures. So, for example, at eight slots, this, these are plots of the uh, time average particle volume fraction. A more square shaped bed is achieved compared to the octagonal bed uh, shown before. And this is visible due to the large particle buildup before this slot and the small amount of particle buildup before the next slot. So, nearly creating a square shaped bed. Uh, adding more gas inlets forms a more uniform particle bed, both uh, radially and also in uh, Absolute value is based on particle volume fraction. It's much more uniform compared to the eight slot geometry. Um, this non uniformity can also be identified when looking at some time averaged uh, mass fractions profiles. Uh, these are obtained at steady state. Um, so, both our reactants, uh, methane and oxygen, are, uh, are converted to most 
in the locations of the highest particle volume fraction, which in the case of eight slots is present right before one end of slots and less to the, to the next, while the highest particle volume fraction is present between uh, the different end of slots as 16 uh, end of slots. Um, yeah, so it's much more, much more uniform here compared to the eight slot geometry. And this would uh, presume yeah, so one could presume that uh, more uniform particle distribution leads to the most optimal operation uh, and as a higher number of inner slots uh, can be preferred. However, once we look uh, at the most important uh, products and side products in the OCM process, uh, the desired two products, which are uh, ethylene and ethane, and the most important side products, which are CO and CO2, um, yeah, this could be concluded as well. Uh, so. The most most of the products are formed right once again at the highest uh, volume fraction of the particles. And here at the top right of the slide, I show some uh, some metrics of these reactive simulations. Basically, the methane conversion, the selectivity towards our different uh, products, the complete C2 selectivity, and our uh, C2 yield. Um, so there's an increase of around eight percent in conversion when increasing the number of inlet slots, but this leads to a small decrease in a uh, in c2 selectivity which leads to the same amount of uh, ethane and ethylene uh, formed at the outlet so uh, mass fractions of similar shape are encountered compared to the reactions of methane and, and oxygen um, it's true that right now very low conversions are obtained but this is due to the conservative nature of these simulations lowering the temperatures to ensure stability um, and that, uh, yeah, in adiabatic simulations, there, there is an adiabatic temperature increase over the bed of around yeah, a couple of 100 Kelvin, as was also visible in the in the uh, validation of our uh, reactive framework in the adi adiabatic case. So I hope to share uh, with you very soon some adiabatic results of these uh, GSVR simulations, but this is what I can show uh, for now, since this is still uh, ongoing work. So to conclude, uh, I showed several validation studies in different geometries, um, validating each aspect of our CRDDM codes, which was heat transfer, reactive framework, uh, and also hydrodynamics, which was now shown in the GSVR. Um, but there's also data available uh, where we validated the fluidized thread geometries, where we determined the minimum fluidization velocities or the transient segregation of uh, small and large particles in a public dispersed bed. Um, I showed you why the GSVR is an ideal candidate for, for OCM by means of high particle mixing and intensity mass transfer. And finally, I ended with some uh, isothermal GSVR results. So what's next? Um, this briefly, yeah, close to the end of my talk. So even though I already achieved much with this model, I want to look further into heat transfer in the GSVR. Um, this has now only been done and validated inside of fluidized bed geometry. However, therefore, uh, experimental data is, is, uh, is needed, and that's not present now. Um, instead of working isothermally inside the GSVR, uh, we need to look at adiabatic operation. Since cooling within the chamber is not possible, there will be an adiabatic temperature increase of our particles. Um, and therefore, a follow-up adiabatic uh, study will be performed, uh, hopefully with both particle agglomeration and institute adaptive tabulation as speed-up methods. Um, it's my goal also to make uh, this code freely available via GitHub, um, and this will be done once the results of this adiabatic uh, study are published in Digiture. So if you're interested in using this code yourself, stay tuned, or you can find the basic version of CRDM coupling also right now on GitHub. Um, I'd like to thank the several different institutions for financial support, and also all my colleagues at the LCT for both uh, mental support and, uh, and guidance. So thank you for your attention. If there are any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or to contact me via email at a later time. Thank you. Thank you, Florian, for your uh, presentation. There's actually one question from uh, Lila. Can you comment on the scaling of the computation power in terms of particle numbers? Yes, so uh, as I mentioned before, we're using a different, uh, I'll go back. We use two different codes. Uh, so there's lights, which is a highly, highly optimized DM solver, uh, and open form on the other side. Uh, so what happens? Scalability 
um, worked really well up to a number of, I think, 64 cores, after which the, the, yeah, the transfer between op the data transfer between op form and likes becomes a limiting factor due to a lot of processor boundaries. Um, but calculating the, the particle trajectories and uh, collisions uh, is very well paralyzed in, in lights. The limiting factor becomes the communication between open foam and lights. Um, but for the geometries, we're currently investigating this does not become an issue. I hope that solves your uh, question. I hope it uh, answers Lila's uh, question indeed, since there are, I don't think there are any other questions so far. Thank you again, Florian. And yes. let's move forward to our uh, last speaker from today. It's Dr. Ina van Beek from Diabetics. I think they're well known within the VSC because they've been using the infrastructure for quite some time already. So, Ina, the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay, can you all hear me? Because um, it's not Inna who's <laughs> presenting today. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. uh, fortunately, she, she lost her voice, uh, so I will be replacing her. Um, is, it, is it sound fine? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, give me a second. Sorry, I um, still need to open the presentation. I thought it was uh, with autom automatically open, right? and so let me bring it up. Well, <clears throat> um, can you can you see the presentation now? Sorry for this, guys. Yes, maybe just switch switch to full screen, then it's perfect. Okay. Um, voilà, like this. Now it should be fine. Is it okay like this? Yeah. All right. Perfect. perfect. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so, um, uh, well, thank you all for, for attending. Um, my name is Lieven. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Diabetics. Uh, Ines is my head of R&D. Unfortunately, uh, she lost her voice uh, yesterday after a few days of her sore throat, so I'll be replacing her um, for this uh, for this talk. Um, but I will, uh, well, the, the slide deck, I have to give her credits for it because she uh, she prepared full slides, but uh, the first part of the, the slide deck will just be an explanation of uh, what we do, who we are as diabetics and what we do exactly um, with, uh, uh, with our company and how we use uh, open foam for, the, for our activities. Um, and the uh, second part of, uh, of the talk will contain quite a few uh, well, I think the best way to explain is our tips and tricks on, on how we, um, what we learned actually over the past years um, in, the most, um, in the most effective way when, when using it for uh, either calculations and supercomputers, because there are quite a few, um, quite a few buttons and tweaks you can apply that, that can actually um, um, speed up your simulations uh, quite quite significantly. So I will go over a few of our um, of, of our yeah learnings that we apply on a on a daily basis to uh, to gain uh, get the most out of uh, HPC computing. Um, now maybe just as a as a warm up and a start and um, what is diabetics? Uh, well, we are a company. We started uh, well. I started the company uh, together with my co-founder uh, seven years ago, and say, since day one, the focus uh, was on helping other companies with their thermal design. So it's basically helping other co companies uh, developing the cooling for their uh, products and their products that can range from uh, cooling, uh, providing cooling designs for electrical cars up to uh, cooling for uh, full server rooms or uh, up to the smallest uh, CPU uh, level. Um, now we don't do it um, by hand, but we, we have developed what we can call a pretty smart uh, software for it. Which partly builds on uh, on open form technology, um, which is basically implements quite a few, uh, uh, in my view, uh, brilliant and, and very smart algorithms that that basically empower the engineer to do more than uh, than he would be able to do it by himself. So, in, in other words, we actually what what we actually have developed is is a software that combines 
uh, AI with um, with with the, the classical simulation uh, or the, the classical classical engineering approach from from thermal design and optimization, and put that all together, uh, and we have now a, a basically a self-learning system that can design cooling components uh, fully autom uh, autonomously. And so, and if you would uh, look at it from from a design cycle perspective, uh, which many of our customers, uh, of course, are are most interested in. In is that the conventional design cycle, uh, there you would have, you would start from your product, uh, your problem description, um, where the engineer is, uh, is faced with, okay, I have your product and if they don't provide cooling, it heats up. Um, you will provide an initial design of what the cooling shapes need to look like and starts iterating on it uh, through CFD simulations, making them, uh, post-processing them, potentially making a physical test um, via prototyping. Uh, and then assessing is this initial design good or not. Part of that workflow can also be uh, automated with parametric optimization, et cetera. Um, and in the end, you end up then with uh, a solution with a heatsink uh, design, a cooling component uh, design, like the one that you see here on the left uh, bottom side, uh, for instance, a an, an very traditional S-shaped kind of cooling channel. Uh, now, the main disadvantage of that approach is that uh, in the end, your final performance is directly linked to the initial design that you uh, that you create, um, or that you uh, your, your initial starting point, because if you would start from a uh, pin fin design, the chances that you will end up with an a shape uh, kind of cooling channel uh, with through through parametric optimization is, is basically zero and cannot be done. Um, our approach, uh, through then the, what you call the generative design approach, goes via uh, uh, AI driven design, as we like to call it ourselves. Um, so you basically give uh, only the problem description to the, the software. Um, that once uh, the software starts uh, iterating over it, uh, runs a whole series of uh, analysis. Uh, so to get to a final design, looking at the, uh, as the one at the bottom, it's not something that is done in in one one CFD run, uh, but it's typically a series uh, of 500 to 1,000 uh, consecutive CFD runs that are uh, executed to end up with a design like that. Uh, clearly, that's also not the kind of process that you want to use uh, your regular uh, desktop or your regular laptop for, because you will block it for weeks, if not months, um, before arriving to a, a final solution. So for us, uh, using HPC is, is literally the only way of, of making our business work, because uh, if you would not do it, um, we would not use it. We have to tell customers, okay, thanks for your input, uh, come back in two or three years, and then we will have your solution, uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, basically ridiculous. Um, a typical workflow for us, um, you can you can look at it as an extension of, of the regular CFD workflow, uh, where we would also uh, Start with uh, start with the geometry. We would set boundary conditions um, and set, uh, set set material properties for the for every region. Um, on top of that, and that's an extent part, uh, we also have to define then uh, targets. Uh, for instance, for this uh, kind of uh, cooling jacket, uh, I, that's at least what it what it should represent. Um, there, you would say, okay, internally we have an electric motor which heats up. We want to cool it as, as high as possible. So, at the contact surface between the motor and the cooling jacket, there we want to have the temperature as low as possible, for instance. Uh, and then you press the start button, and that's where then the the work is uh, is done by the um, I, where where the, the supercomputer part uh, comes into um, into play. And uh, after one week, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes four weeks, depending on the complexity of your model. You end up with an um, you end up with an optimized design. Now, when you're when you're forced um, with these kind of, of run times, of course, you don't have any other choice than optimizing for speed. Because eh? you uh, even again, um, even even uh, an improvement in speed of of one or two or three percent on that workflow can make a difference uh, between delivering a design uh, one day, two days, even three days earlier. Then, uh, then if you don't do that, uh, if you don't apply that that optimization, um, so we are really searching. Uh, so we have been searching and still ongoing from day one on how can we speed up every step of the full cycle, going from uh, case configuration up to running the case itself, uh, a bit with more advanced conversions control stuff like that, up to uh, improving the speed of, of reading and writing uh, their data. 
Um, now, initially we started with, with pure custom heatsink design, as we call it now, which is the last part. Uh, over the past few years, we all add, also added a, few, uh, a number of additional services um, on just providing regular thermal analysis uh, via our, our Coldstream platform. Um, that's now the, the product in which we wrapped all, all of that. Um, and uh, standard design selection. But there again, it all comes down to the same thing. The faster and the better we make our simulations, basically the more margin, the, big, the bigger profit margin that we, that we gain. So we have all the incentive to keep on investing in improving it. Um, I'll, I'll first show you a few examples to, to illustrate um, what, the kind of, um, what the kind of applications that we typically then, then handle with, the, uh, with, with our Coldstream platform to give you an, also an idea of of the physics that are involved. And so the starting point for us is always um, um, a, a basically multi multi region approach in, in open form terms. And so where we have on the one hand a cooling fluid and then one or two or multiple uh, solid bodies. Most of the examples that you, you will see here uh, will only contain two or three uh, bodies at max uh, or solid regions at max. Um, but we have uh, process cases with more than 200 uh, different regions uh, defined, most of them in, in solid regions. Um, so, um, for instance, um, and, and very classical or very traditional air cooled uh, electronics problem that you would uh, that we would uh, would have to, to analyze would be a number of, of circuit boards mounted on a, on a solid heatsink. Um, which uh, basically, and everyone, every of those modules uh, generates some heat. And then the question is, okay, how, how can we cool it down to the uh, to the maximal extent if we have two fans available? And one of the outputs of of, uh, of one of the results that that uh, Coldstream will produce then is uh, providing this uh, this very detailed uh, channel structure and uh, the combination of those those fins with those more elongated structures. That's then the kind of calculation that uh, or the, the result that we would uh, provide based on uh, the input you see here at the, at the bottom left. Um, same thing uh, we do for uh, previous examples for air cooling. Um, same thing we do for uh, battery cooling for electrical vehicles, because there the, the, the lifetime of your um, for battery is directly uh, correlated to the temperatures and the temperature uniformity that it reach. Um, and all of that would be easy to solve um, if not for production constraints, because in this case, typically battery cooling is uh, is is done via via liquid cold plates, as they call it, uh, sheet metal cold plates, which are very, two very thin uh, plates that of which one is deformed and and welded onto a flat uh, other one by the deformation you create channel and that channel structure the way it looks is essential or is critical for uh, to get to proper cooling or not and that's where the the channels come into play and it's for that that we have developed uh, a software solution. A uh, few other examples, um, uh, the electric motor, this is something we have done with the Formula student team uh, from Leuven and also from Delft, maybe the Formula student team, maybe it rings a bell for, for some. It's uh, from, um, I think they call it still Group D, industrial engineers who develop every year a new Formula student uh, car, basically a, race, a small electrical race car, who have, uh, who use an, uh, four in-wheel motors uh, to drive their, their uh, uh, drive their car or to accelerate the car. Um, interesting there is um, they have um, they have a speed limit uh, when they go into competition, um, and that makes it for them it's not that important to what uh, to reach a very high maximal power and to to reach very high speeds because uh, they're simply bound by the the regulations. But for them it's much more important to be able to accelerate them very fast because faster acceleration uh, acceleration and far faster braking would would mean that they actually have a higher average velocity and therefore can can win the race. Um, and to reach those kind of uh, uh, acceleration um, and reach the acceleration requirements that they have, there you can actually um, like use our system as well to get uh, to improve in the cooling so that they can actually reach uh, the the desired levels. Because um, cooling is there uh, literally the bottleneck and to to reach them. Um, and here on the left hand side, you see then the kind of design that uh, Coldstream uh, would produce. Uh, compared to a parametric one here at the bottom right. Uh, efficiency increases are typically in the order of 15, 20, 25% with this kind of approach. But clearly, 
if you see the designs on the left hand side, this is not something you will be able to design by hand. Um, now you can do the same thing for uh, uh, another very critical application, I would say, and that's then for CPUs itself. And so that's uh, thing, one, one thing that uh, uh, is kind of ironically, we use massive CPU power to then calculate how to cool the CPUs in the best possible way. Um, and uh, we have a number of, of our customers um, now investigating also the possibility of applying liquid cooling uh, to 3D printed uh, 3D printed CPUs or CNC milled uh, CPU school uh, CPU coolers, and then you get uh, designs like you see here on the left hand side, which uh, completely break with the traditional approach of parallel uh, fins or uh, or pin uh, kind of structures in on your heatsink. Um, again, there thermal term resistance improvements of 10, 15 percent are perfectly within within range. Uh, and if you reach that, you can you can look at it from two different angles. Either you uh, say, okay, perfect, my chip is uh, is now 10% uh, colder uh, than it used to be, so uh, it will uh, last longer. Uh, but in practice, what actually happens is that um, the chips will be used uh, at a, at higher power levels or basically overclocked uh, to get more out of uh, the same chip. Because the, the reason there is the lifetime of those chips is, is uh, anyway bound by two, two and a half years. So we better get the most out of it rather than having them last for five years because then they will be simply old and, and slow compared to the newer generations. Um, and uh, of course, if you, if, I want, if you, if you apply this uh, on, uh, on, on a big scale, on, on um, big server rooms, um, by this, uh, by applying this approach, you can actually save millions a year, um, for especially for the big, uh, let's say, social media networks and uh, the Googles of this uh, this world. Um, gaining 10% on in cooling is for them uh, a multi-million dollar business. <clears throat> That's also why we are interested in, in it, of course. <laughs> um, now. Uh, I hope this is already uh, paints you a picture of what we do exactly, about the type of problems that we are trying to solve. Now, <clears throat> we uh, over the past few years, uh, uh, well, maybe to give you an, uh, a little bit of context, but the day we started uh, seven years ago, uh, we had background in, in open form and open form development uh, through the experience uh, primarily I had. Um, and over the past few years, we built upon uh, basically we build an, an uh, more and more extensive uh, open uh, set of open form libraries and started to build tools around that and, and started to build a full, a full software set around it. And on the one hand, we have our uh, what we call our backend software, which runs, um, by, which uses an open form for the simulations. And on the other hand, we have now a front end uh, application called Coldstream, which is basically an, uh, a software as a service uh, platform where, you, where customers can actually use. Uh, using control or backend software. Uh, so our customers itself, they don't come in direct, uh, they don't uh, interact directly with, with OpenFORM. Uh, well, most of them know that this OpenFORM is running in the background, but they have never seen any of the configuration files because um, all of that is now built up in uh, in the backend uh, fully, uh, fully automatically. And also for that, have, we have very, very specific reasons why we would automate those kind of things uh, to the full extent. Um, now, in, in, uh, in line with the previous uh, um, uh, previous uh, talks, uh, what can I say about? Uh, I can say a few things about about the backend software. Um, the meshing is based on Snappy HexMesh. Um, we have a customized solver there. We saw some some issues with Snappy HexMesh, which which uh, uh, we, we we have solved uh, because there were some of them were blocking us. We have solved uh, internally, so we have now a customized version. The solver as well is a fully customized solver. Um, it's based. I think it's based to 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 the let's say for for seventy percent on the approach of of what you have in the CHT multi-region form, um, but then again there are some some fundamental differences again to gain uh, performance, um, and then post-processing uh, tools. There we uh, we we use actually the function objects uh, massively, and that's um, that's also something I will I will come back uh, I will come back upon. Now, a typical workflow also for us, same for everyone, is you start with the geometry generation. Once you have the, the geometry, uh, we, we create a mesh. Um, if the mesh is set up, you, you set up the case itself and uh, run the case for the solution. And afterwards, you do 
the post processing. Uh, not really, um, not really rocket science there. But what I will do for uh, for remainder of uh, I, the slides to come, what I will do is touch upon each of those uh, each of those blocks. And you see here, pre-processing, post-processing, code development, and testing, and give you a few of our best practices there. Uh, so that uh, afterwards, after this session, I hope you at least you have a few things that you will uh, remember uh, from from this talk and that you will be able to apply in, in practice. Okay, so let's um, let's start with the with the pre-processing part. Um, one one thing I I teach uh, and I really have to teach it when when we hire uh, new employees here, uh, especially within the R and D department is um there's there's one thing that that engineers are trained for is yeah do it in um uh to to get to the to most accurate mesh description uh or uh when you create a mesh to make the mesh as accurate as possible uh from your first go uh first thing we have to try and we'll come uh, we, we have to explain them and teach them is um if your mesh if your mesh it's not the hex mesh if you don't uh, if if you if, if your full case doesn't run with an unsnapped mesh, uh, don't try to snap it because if you do so, um, it will not improve any part of your simulation afterwards. Um, so uh, the best piece of advice I can can give everyone, uh, starting with uh, open form and snap, starting with snappy hex mesh, etc. First, disable snapping uh, and layer addition. Uh, and, and run your full case on a simplified mesh, um, an unsnapped mesh, uh, so that at least you know that your case setup runs uh, runs smoothly. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, main reason I will uh, we'll come back in, in a few seconds uh, for that. Uh, the second thing is when you, especially when you're you're dealing with heat transfer. Um, Open foam has the as, as a very nice nice feature available where uh, you can actually mesh every region individu individually. Um, and if you would uh, if you combine them the the boundaries through um, the AMI uh, patches and the arbitrary mesh interface uh, approach, if you apply that region, uh, if you apply that approach, you can expect differences in in energy balances over every heat over every interface of. 10, 15 percent because of numerical uh, uh, because of numerical issues. So there again, simply don't uh, don't do that. Uh, if you if you have a multi-region case, uh, mesh all regions together. Snappy hex mesh is capable of doing that and split them afterwards so that uh, that you have a fully conformal uh, mesh interface at your interfaces. Um, conformal simply means on the one side of your region, I uh, region region one, you have the same faces as in region two, so that they exactly overlap if you want to do the simulation. Even that works in, in when you snap your mesh. And so there's you can perfectly um, mesh all regions together, including snapping. The interface will be resolved, and but split them afterwards. Don't don't mesh them separately. Although it's extremely tempting, because uh, that way you will have, probably have Better meshes for each of the mesh of the regions uh, individually, um, but if you do it again, your heat balance will be um, will be highly unreliable, and you will have to do a lot of testing and a lot of verification, um, and and to see if the if the balances actually actually add up. Um, and the reason um, the reason why I say about uh, I why I stress so much about the, the stress so much about run it with uns uh, with unsnapped meshing first. Open foam is a um, I've been working with open foam now for I think almost 15 years. Um, I started with version 1.6 uh, and it was at the time that is still numbered uh, in that in that kind of way. Um, if 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 there's one thing I, I I have learned over the past years is open foam is very very sensitive um, to mesh quality. Um, if you um, even if you would make the perfect case setup with the physics all in place like they should be, even if you do that, there's no guarantee that with a bad mesh or a, or a highly skewed mesh uh, or highly orthogonal mesh, a uh, non-orthogonal mesh, that you will actually get to a converged uh, converge result uh, because of the mesh quality. Um, so there, even be, I always, before you start running a simulation, do a check mesh. Just run the utility and if it says, mesh fails, 
uh, um, well, believe it, because if you don't uh, don't listen to it, um, you will get into troubles afterwards. So that's why um, we, the reason why why we stress so much here for new new employees, uh, if they develop something uh, and they want to test it, that they have to test with unsnap meshes. Basically, uh, your check mesh will always result uh, a very good. Uh, I will always give uh, that, that their mesh is perfectly fine to run open form with, and that's also our our, um, our experience. If uh, uh, with unsnap, I with unsnap mesh uh, meshes, you can perfectly test the rest of your case setup, uh, and once that is fully fully ready, you can enable snapping. And at least if the simulation then fails, you know it's due to the snapping and not anything else further down um, your workflow. <clears throat> Um, one thing we went, uh, I, with respect to the case setup itself, then one thing we went very far in with, uh, with, uh, with diabetics is uh, the, the automation of the case setup itself. Um, when I did my PhD about yeah, it was, uh, eight, uh, up to eight years ago, um, I, uh, it will be the same probably for, for many in the audience. Uh, when I did my PhD myself, I had to repeat certain simulations several times with uh, several uh, parameters which then uh, moderately changed or sometimes was meshing that changes or the geometry that slight, slightly changes. Um, and at a certain moment, you will reach the point where you actually didn't know anymore what you changed uh, compared to your version, uh, your first version, or you applied mu multiple changes at the same time. Um, and uh, because of the, the whole file structure of OpenFOAM is on top of that even, even difficult already to set up one, one case because it requires so many different files and so many different parameters as an, as an input. And there's absolutely no basis, especially for highly customized cases. There's no basis on which you can, you can build except for the very simple tutorials that are, that are available. So even when you're just starting with OpenFOAM, learn how to script. Batch scripting, uh, especially on supercomputers, is uh, I, it's a, it's a perfect tool for it. Uh, That's also how, how we started here uh, with diabetics. Uh, seven years ago, at this moment, uh, I now we of course we, we have something something more advanced in place, fully built on, on Python, etc. But uh, bash scripting will do the job for you because um, the making case setup errors, it's very easily done, and it will uh, will I will require a lot of I it will ask a lot of time for you uh, to to um, uh, to fix them, and then. Um, uh, second uh, second error we see uh, we see a lot uh, or I, I saw a lot happening with, with new employees uh, employees we had um, the some experience with with open form is um, there is a utility called renumber mesh and that's this is where we can then move into the the HPC part there is a utility uh, called renumber mesh um, for those with a mathematical background or non-mathematical background, <laughs> the, the utility itself, what it does is it takes your, uh, basically takes your mesh and the numbering of your mesh and renumbers uh, the cells to get a more diagonal matrix um, and more dynamic uh, or diagonally dominant matrix. Um, the more di diagonally, dom diagonally dominant the matrix is, well, the more robust your simulation will run. And so it makes your solvers, uh, the solvers that you set in, in the FA solutions uh, file, it will make them more robust and more friendly for your, uh, for your application. Um, one thing to remember, and it's not I, it's not stated clearly in the documentation, or at least it did not it was it was not stated clearly. Maybe it changed by now, but uh, renumber mesh only makes sense on the final mesh on which you run. And so, if you run on HPC um, infrastructure and you run in parallel, firstly compose your case after you you did your case setup, and ideally after you change the parameter that you wanted to change in your script and you let the case setup be built up by your script and you decompose the case, that's the moment to run renumber mesh. And when I say that's the moment to run it, uh, please just run it because you will be wasting computational resources from, from everyone and it will make your simulation harder to, to converge. Renumber mesh is one step or one part uh, on how to um, how to optimize your, your um, uh, your your simulation uh, or the simulation speed. The second thing um, we we optimized um, was the uh, well the control deck itself. The the optim uh, we we um, put quite some effort in 
investigating how does the the writing and the reading of files actually uh, influence open form um, and the runtime of open form and the results there were, were actually uh, yeah surprising uh, well surprising but it was almost stunning <laughs> um, at this moment with diabetics we run on we, we have five different supercomputers five different HPC installations that we that we have at our availability for both R and D and for uh, and for production uh, uh, for production cases, um, and all of them have a different uh, different operating systems, different uh, configurations as well, different hardware. But there's one common thing with all of them: none of them are fast in I/O operations. Um, and I/O operations literally means when you would start your case, um, just when when you you. I run simple form, uh, for instance. The, the first operations that it does is simply reading your mesh, reading your input files, or when you when you write in, in a time step, when you write your final data, um, <clears throat> those operations are then the I.O. operations. Um, the, the the slowdown you get by those uh, by those iterations is is uh, gigantic. Um, so uh, to, to put it in numbers, but I'll go deeper in it on the next slide. So, but to, to put it in numbers, you can gain a factor of 10 uh, if you have very I/O intensive jobs. Um, then, then I would really listen because you can gain up to a factor of 10 in, in simulation speed. Uh, for us, where does it come into play? Well, I told you, yeah, we have to run 500 to 1,000 uh, 1,000 iterate uh, CFD runs. Um, all which start a full CFD simulation and write the data again, start up uh, and write the data again. So it it requires a lot of uh, I/O operations just by the nature of the problem that we're uh, that we're trying to solve. So we had no choice into optimizing it. Uh, two years ago, when we uh, at a certain moment we started implementing um, uh, measurement steps, where we I, uh, yeah we call it profiling. Um, I, we start implementing profiling um, uh, commands into our code to see where we lo uh, lost the most time. Two years ago, at twenty percent of our uh, of our time to, was not spent on um, the actual CPU calculations itself of open form part, which for us is the bottleneck. Yeah? So 80% of the, the runtime went to uh, the parallel computing, 20% went basically went to all into overhead. Uh, today we are at, uh, at that, that for us was was a trigger to say, okay, we need to change something. Today we are at 99% of uh, parallel computing time and only 1% of overhead. So the 20% that we had two years ago is, has reduced to 1%. And one of the uh, one of the main things we changed was only in the control dict we, we added a few flags. Um, first flag that we added was um, or that we configured uh, were the perch write the write interval and the runtime uh, modifiable flag. So the the perch write or uh, many of you will probably be uh, be, be uh, familiar with it. Um, but perch write basically what it does is you write a new time step and it removes the old one again. Um, you write a new time step and you move the old one uh, again. So you only stick with two, one, two, three time steps in your folder. Uh, don't underestimate the time it takes to delete data. Uh, deleting data can take up to, uh, if you have a case, even if it's only from uh, for, for five or 10 million cells or one million cells, it can take five to 10 seconds to do that. So if you're writing uh, a thousand time steps uh, because of a transient uh, simulation, uh, think about whether you really want to do it that way. If you if you are deleting the time steps anyway, maybe there's a smarter way. Because ten uh, a thousand time steps, five time five seconds deleting your previous time step means you're actually spending almost two hours of waiting uh, on I/O operations, which are basically useless there. Um, same same thing. The write interval. The less you write, the better. Uh, and then the 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 runtime modifiable flag. Um, as soon as you know what your case setup is, and so the, the runtime modifiable flag, modifiable flag by default it's set to a yes, uh, but basically what it does is every every iteration um, within within open form it will check all of the files whether the time uh, and date has changed or not because that will be an indication that you actually edited the file. Um, by switching that def, uh, switching that off, you immediately gain ten percent uh, in runtime. That's um, I, of course depending on on how, how, how big your case is, but in our case, and we, we we run on on average on 20 million cells uh, per region. 
uh, it's 10% uh, of gain. <clears throat> now, the biggest gain that we actually got uh, that we actually got was um, was actually switching from ASCII to binary format. Um, binary format is only something I learned when I was working at uh, at, open, uh, at at diabetics during my my time uh, in my PhD. I never use it because I wanted to see uh, what the what the files were, and, and the only way of, of reading them is when you write them in ASCII format. By writing them in binary format, um, the file sizes reduces by a factor of three. So a gigabyte file becomes 300 megabytes file. And uh, similarly, the, uh, the deletion time and the writing speed uh, also um, decreases, or the writing time and deletion time decreases by, a fact, by the same factor of three. Um, so that's, uh, again, as soon as you know what the format is, uh, if you, if, as soon as you have your, your case setup ready, uh, switch to, to binary because there's absolutely no reason to, to, to stick to ASCII uh, and you're simply losing time again there. Um, and one thing that, that uh, our, our last modification was uh, switching the write format uh, to, to collated uh, format. So uh, especially with, uh, oh yeah, so that's the format dedicated for HPC clusters. There are two two problems with, with HPC clusters when you would use a uh, open form in the in the, the native uh, way so to speak is when you um, when you decompose your case in the processor folders uh, well every processor gets by default one folder and every folder there will be x number of files uh, for your p field for your t field for your u field uh, and all the other fields that you have in your simulation um, and if you decompose into a thousand uh, a thousand uh, for CPUs, for instance, and then uh, then you have a thousand times all, all of those files that you have to write and read every time you start up or you um, um, you, you stop your case. Uh, with the collated format, it's not a case. There you have the choice to write it either per node or just one big file for all uh, for all the processors at the same time. Because the I/O itself is just one mod, it's just one uh, one reader that reads it and then distributes it anyway over the different processors. So there's no, there's no, no, I, there's no point to have it in, in separate folders because you, you will be blocked by the same, uh, the same system. And there again, <clears throat> by switching to the collated or host collated um, system, um, there again, you gain 10, 15% um, on very complex cases. And that's how we, we reduced over the past two years uh, our overhead of 20% reduce it to, to 1%. <clears throat> um, then uh, one, uh, one thing, I cannot stress it enough, um, you should always do, uh, even when you have everything scripted, always check uh, your job script once more and your case setup, because um, again, uh, CFD simulations are not for free and you should not treat them like that, even if you don't have to pay your, your credits yourself. Um, check your job script, job script and your case setup uh, once more. Perhaps you write a utility that does uh, a number of additional checks, um, just to make sure that when you start something, that you can be that you can rely on the output itself. Now, in the output, um, you, the, the output, yeah, in, in CFD, everything is big. And so uh, we, are, we, we are active in a, uh, we are active in a world where also um, generative design um, is used in, in structural engineering. Um, in that world, they work, work with with, um, with just the finite element uh, simulations. Basically, with finite element, it's all manageable, uh, so to speak, and so all. Uh, can all be done either on a computer or a small cluster. In CFD, it's not the case. If you want to do it decently, uh, if you take the the case of um, uh, of the first talk and the Mira reactor as an example, running something with 300 million cells, it's not trivial anymore. Uh, and the data that is generated, it's huge. So if you if you don't think about the post processing before you start, um, then you will probably waste a number of iterations before you can actually uh, uh, can, before you can actually use your your uh, output data in a very efficient way, and and that's where where the, uh, the very big gain is. If you think about it in advance, well, OpenFOAM has a whole series of function objects available um, that can do a big part of processing for you, and uh, you simply have to use them whenever you can. Uh, it's as simple as that. Uh, the, our, our Coldstream platform, it's not an active 
post-processor, uh, but what it actually does is visualizing all the data that are that is generated by a function objects. There's there's uh, nothing in between. It's just open form producing uh, VTK data of certain uh, streamlines, for instance, of temperature data, etc. And uh, Coldstream will will visualize that data, um, and and you have it in a matter of a few clicks. But if you want to load a 20 million or 50 million uh, or even 5 million case into your power view, uh, you will waste time again. Uh, and time, as, I mean, there's there's much better ways of, of spending time than just waiting for, for para view to, to finish loading your case and then having to wait 15, 20, 30 seconds before, uh, after every time you click uh, with your mouse. Now, um, with the code develop, uh, with respect to code development, that's uh, the one but last topic I wanted to uh, address. Um, especially when when you're working on on uh, I, when you start with your PhD or when you um, when you when you know that you're working on a project for a longer period of time or you're doing a joint development of code, um, understand you should understand how Open Form works. On the one hand, I, on the uh, on the one hand. Form has a, has a widely complex um, uh, network of, of branches and, and, uh, and forks that are available, uh, but the two main ones are the foundation release and then you have the ESI release. We ourselves use the ESI one uh, because it's more has some more industrial related features which are uh, very useful for us, uh, but you can use either one of both. But what you should understand from the beginning that you start working at this, those guys don't sit still. They are actively developing um, they are actively developing open form and if you uh, know that you will be using open form yourself for x number of years um, update regularly uh, and regularly means uh, we have the rule here internally at least once every year and a half meaning we can skip one or two versions but the third one we will update them because um, if you don't follow that pace you will have it uh, it will become harder and harder and harder uh, to update either all your cases or uh, to, uh, and to update um, the custom code that you um, that you have written yourself. Uh, that being said, never touch the original open form uh, installation because if you do that, you will not be able to update uh, easily with uh, with open form. Uh, you you will not be uh, be able to update it easily. I always create new custom libraries separate from your uh, open form um, open form installation so that if you update open form at least you can compile it without the changes that you made yourself. Um, and um, that being said, even if you I, if you are developing yourself and you're customizing a code or you're writing a, a set of classes, uh, change one at a time and don't change two, three, four things at the same time. Because uh, if it fails, if you run your test, uh, a small test case um, and, and it fails, you will not know what the reason was for that failure. And so. Um, do it one, that, uh, one step at a time. And we actually have on our on our website, um, uh, our diabetics website on our blog, uh, I wrote a blog a few years ago uh, titled how to successfully fail at CFD. That's one of the rules that I uh, lay out there. So uh, feel free to have a look at, the, at our website. You will find it there um, and it contains about, I think it's 10, 10 or 12 tips on, on how to successfully fail at, at CFD. The trick is not to do any of the things that I mentioned there. Uh, and changing one, two, or three things at the same, uh, two, three, or four things at the same time, I think it's number one or number two in the list. Um, similarly, when you, um, uh, when I redo all our developments um, within, um, ah, thank you, Tim. <laughs> uh, see it now, it's, it's in, uh, Tim has put it in the chat. Um, so when you, when you do the uh, code development, uh, all our code developments we do is um, on supercomputers directly. Um, we simply have the rule here internally that no employee can have this, our sources on, the, on their own personal computers. Um, so we do all the development remotely. <coughs> but uh, when you develop with a few people uh, on the same code, and even when you work with a few people on the same cases, or even if you don't and you just want to have uh, I, you, you just want to be smart, but uh, use a system like Git to manage the different um, the different versions that you have of your files, of your um, uh, and of your of your code itself, because um, that will allow you to uh, go back when you when you see from testing that you made a made a mistake. 
Um, and for testing, that's really the last thing I'm going to say, is for testing, I cannot stress this enough, always, always, always use a simple test case, preferably on an unsnapped mesh um, with a standard solver that doesn't use your library to get started with um, and gradually build upon the complexity so that your simple test at a certain moment becomes the final application that you see on the left hand side. But if the thing on the right hand side here, the simple test doesn't work, your final application will fail for sure as well. Voilà. That was uh, from, I, I, in a nutshell, our, our experience uh, or our, our, I, the things that I wanted to share about uh, how we use HPC and, and um, open form for our uh, activities. But if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to share them now via the chat. I'm more than happy to answer them. Many thanks, Lieven, and I hope that uh, best practices will help many of the attendants. Uh, and maybe they can write the blog themselves in a couple of years what they learned from your presentation well actually, actually there's one question from uh, francesco how do you ensure 100 percent manufacturability in your optimization workflow you showed the 100 percent on the the cooling of the chip design i think it was the only place you mentioned it maybe it was by accident yeah um yeah well uh we have our ways <laughs> um and that's uh, that's that's uh, uh, a part of our of our of our uh, set of corporate secrets, uh, so to speak. Um, there are two ways. First of all, don't promise things or don't deliver things that you cannot do. Uh, so if you uh, if you can't handle uh, CNC milling or sheet metal forming, don't say that you can. Um, so we first develop before we uh, before we deliver it. Um, and second thing is, um, yeah. Um, Testing and and um, I, it's uh, ensuring 100% manufacturability is not something that you can do with uh, within within half a year or within a few months of development. And at this moment we are seven years in business, but we started developing uh, the code that we have today and, and basically on day one uh, of our company. Um, and in the meantime, we have a whole series of, of uh, prototypes that have passed and. Um, and, and for sure, the first ones or the first first designs or the first years that we made designs, they were not for, uh, they were definitely not all manufacturable. Um, but these days, uh, we we don't have any any comments on that anymore. So we can perfectly say it's one hundred percent manufacturable because no one no one's actually complaining about it uh, anymore. But yeah, that's a kind of of, of statement uh, where I, I mean it is true until the point it's not true anymore. Uh, and if someone says, okay, but this corner or this small thing is not manufacturable, yeah, then we pass a message to R&D and then hopefully a few days later or a few weeks later, um, that kind of feature is not present anymore in the designs. And then we're again at 100% manufacturability. Many thanks. I think that that's it for today. Uh, thank you again to all speakers. Thank you to all attendees. There's one uh, request that when, when you will leave this meeting, or tomorrow in the follow-up mail, you will get a, a small survey presented. So please take some time to complete it. Uh, there are very basic questions. How helpful was this lunch session? Any ideas for the next topic? And in case you are not using the VSC yet, do you want the VSC to reach out to you? So I'd like all of you to thank you for attending and hope to see you on the next lunch session. Bye-bye. <laughs>